And thanks everybody for having me in your Zoom space once again. Um, enjoy it. And uh, I'm going to share some uh, uh, pictures um, as we go along here. So I'm just going to set that up. Um, uh, microclimates are complicated little beasties that can vary depending on how granular you want to get about them. Um, they can be a drop of water uh, in a uh, in an orchid blossom uh, and and uh, they can be the whole side of your house or your yard or they can be your deck on one side uh, as opposed to your deck on the other side of your building. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to figure out what microclimate is going on in a given area uh, and try to give you some tools for matching the microclimate to some plants that would work well in that microclimate uh, instead of trying to shoehorn a plant into a spot that it's not going to be happy in. So I, I hope by the end of this evening, you'll at least have some resources and some uh, ways to go about analyzing what your microclimates are. Uh, and uh, so we, we're going to uh, give you the tools to fish microclimates rather than giving you uh, a bunch of plants and saying, well, do this with this one and this with this one. Um, I don't think that's a good way to go about it. Uh, so first, we have to talk about the macro climate a little bit here in the Bay Area. Um, you can see the world map up there on the screen and the little blotches of purple uh, that are on each continent except maybe Asia, um, depending on where Asia starts. Um, but these are what people traditionally call Mediterranean climate areas in the world. Um, I prefer the term warm, dry summer, cool, moist winter to Mediterranean. Um, but you can see why it's called Mediterranean because that's the largest basin that has this particular climate. And it's uh, characterized by uh, mild winters uh, that are wet and cool, but not frozen. Uh, and warm but not scorching hot summers, uh, and really only two seasons in in a sense. Uh, some people would argue that there are more than that, but you can think of it as the dry season and the wet season, and that is um, pretty accurate. Now, uh, you might think that some place like New Zealand might have a some place with a Mediterranean climate, but it really doesn't. Um, it's got more moisture, it's got um, more tropical areas, uh, and uh, really doesn't have uh, this kind of climate. So you can see uh, the west coast of the United States uh, from um, kind of mid-California up to uh, Oregon and uh, a little spot uh, along the coast of Chile and a couple of spots in Australia, uh, a little bit uh, on the tip of Africa, uh, basically South Africa, and then the Mediterranean basin uh, as far over as Turkey. Um, and uh, we in the uh, in the nursery business um, bring in a lot of plants from these particular areas because the climate matches the climate here in our part of California. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, many of the of the most typical uh, Mediterranean plants from from Mediterranean Europe. Um, our herbs, um, our lavenders, uh, things that we just um, grow very typically around here and don't even most of the time give a thought to where they come from. But there's a reason why they do well. Uh, plants that come from a completely different kind of climate, think uh, 
eastern United States, where you have a very cold, snowy winter and a very warm, often rainy, uh, humid summer, uh, is, a, is a very different climate than we have here. And it just uh, obviously makes it more difficult to give a good home to plants that come from places that come from a radically different climate. Doesn't mean you can't do it. We grow lots of plants, for instance, from Japan and China, um, and they seem to do fine. We grow plants from the Himalayas. They do fine, but they all need more water, uh, and they often need particular kinds of protection uh, to get them going. Um, now, the best tool that I know to start to match plants to climate uh, is the Sunset Western Garden Book. Um, this is Lane Publishing. Uh, it's no longer published. Uh, Sunset Magazine no longer exists in a print form anyway. It may have some existence on the web, um, but the book is out of print. And it is basically an encyclopedic collection of landscape plants, as well as edible trees, nuts, that sort of thing, um, with descriptions, uh, lists of differences between varieties, and zone information that lets you know whether the plant can handle uh, the climate that we have here. Uh, and this is up here on the top is the climate map for Marin County. Well, actually Marin is down here. We're up in Sonoma County up here in Napa County. Um, but you can see the zones have numbers on them. Uh, Marin is 15, 16, and 17 by the sunset uh, way of making zones. Uh, and for instance, uh, I live in Fairfax, and so I'm in zone 15, and I'm a little bit colder uh, and warmer than zone 17, which is the zone along the coast, uh, the ocean coast and the bay coast. Uh, and then zone 16 is a little more mountainous, Mount Tamalpais, uh, and a little colder yet, uh, although probably not hotter. Uh, but the zones are all laid out, and you can find the zones on the web quite easily by going to just Google up sunset uh, zones uh, or uh, climate zones, and you'll find them quite easily and find the description of the zones. And they'll tell you the uh, minimum temperature uh, that a plant can tolerate um, so that if you find something you're interested in, you can look it up and it'll say, well, it'll handle down to, let's say, 30 degrees. Well, in my garden this year, it got down to 28 degrees. Uh, and so if I knew that I had a plant that could only handle it to 30 or so, I would throw a blanket over it at night when it was frost time. So that's a way of kind of matching some of your plants to our overall climate. Um, you'll notice that all the wine regions up here, so Sonoma Valley, uh, the Alexander Valley up here, the Napa Valley over here, they're all zone 14. Um, so uh, grapes don't grow much in zone 16 or 17. You might be able to grow a few in 15. Um, but uh, they really grow in 14, which is kind of fun. Um, the other, well, the other uh, zone system is the U.S. Department of Agriculture zone system. It's not quite as granular as the sunset system. Uh, it, the USDA's climate zones have uh, everybody in Marin in basically 9A, 9B, or 10A. And you'll often see those zones on the nursery can um, or label uh, when you're going to buy plants. 
uh, and they'll often say something like uh, zone 6B and uh, you're in zone 9B. Does that mean you can't grow them? No. Uh, it means that it can tolerate much colder conditions than we have here. Um, as the zones get lower in number, they get colder at uh, in their cold season. And so a plant that can handle zone six can handle zone nine or 10 without any problem at all as, in terms of the cold. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. There are a few exceptions, things that need the cold, but we're not gonna get into that right now. Uh, I wanted to just pop this picture up. This is a house in my neighborhood that has the sort of archetypical uh, Mediterranean climate plants. Uh, they're not all from the Mediterranean. Some are from the Americas. Some are from, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, some are from South Africa. Um, but you have things like uh, the salvia, the Mexican sage, salvia leucantha. This is a, a nice rosemary, which is from Europe. Um, this is the strawberry tree, European strawberry tree, Arbutus men, uh, unido, Arbutus unido, a relative, the only relative really out there of the madrone tree. Um, back here is an oleander. Uh, there's a yucca here, that's from the Americas. Uh, over here, this light green one is a coleonema, the breath of heaven. Um, I'm not really enamored of the pruning style, but um, it has a pretty pink flower uh, and uh, is from South Africa as well. Uh, I have a suspicion that this might be an olive tree back here, although I, I forgot to look at it closely when I took the picture. Um, but the trunk looks like very olivey uh, and the grayish leaves. So that's uh, definitely European. Uh, and oh, over here is some Nandina, Nandina domestica, the heavenly bamboo. Uh, and all of these have in common that they can handle our very dry summers. Uh, and he's got them planted out on the kind of uh, southwestern side of his house where they're in full sun all day. Uh, and um, they're all well established and he probably doesn't have to water them very much during the summer at all for them to thrive. On the other side of his house, uh, it would be a more northeasterly exposure. Uh, and it would be very different. Um, some of these plants probably would not thrive back there. Uh, and I don't have a picture of it, so I don't know what he's got back there. Um, but what we're starting to see here is, okay, I've got a, a macro climate that's European. And here, my micro climate is that I'm out in the full sun. Um, I don't have uh, a lot of seepage. I'm not by a creek. This is going to be a dry area, and I want plants that are going to be able to tolerate the dryness during the summer. Um, I'm going to skip past these flowers. Um, now, Another of the approaches that people take to the dry part of the landscape is succulents and cacti. Um, here we have a garden that has some um, big agaves, agave americana. This is the variegated one, and this is the blue agave. Uh, and then they've got some opuntias, the prickly pear cactuses over here. Uh, and uh, in the dry hillsides near my house, there's a lot of this kind of landscaping uh, because it tolerates, again, the dryness and the heat uh, during the summer. And there were a lot of Italian and Portuguese immigrants that moved in way back, uh, back when they were building the reservoirs in Marin. And they brought with them uh, some of these plants, even though these are originally New World plants, um, they made their way around the world very quickly and are very popular in uh, most all Mediterranean uh, climate areas now. 
Um, this is a, an interesting way to look and sort of analyze um, microclimates. Uh, the side of this house uh, demonstrates a couple of uh, interesting things. Uh, one is you've got a tall south-facing wall of the building, which is going to absorb a lot of heat and radiate it back out during the night, uh, which is uh, a phenomenon that helps uh, a lot of plants. Um, you have a stone walkway, which is also going to absorb heat during the summer and radiate it out at night. Uh, and uh, then you have a very small planting area with a fence that blocks the sun. So the area, the ground doesn't get very much direct sun. So you've got the light and the heat of the sun but you've got a relatively cool root zone, which would be relatively easy to keep moist, uh, which is important because this is a deciduous magnolia, beautifully in bloom, which is from the Himalayas and not from a Mediterranean climate at all. Uh, it is deciduous. It could take a lot more cold than we have to give it, but it doesn't need it. Um, but it does need cool, moist roots to be at its best. And so this is really planted to take advantage of the combination of the warmth here, which will help it to set buds and to um, thrive here, and the coolness of the soil, which helps it immensely during, during the summer. Uh, so I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, combination of the the warmth, but at the same time the coolness, and you can think of those as microclimate elements. Um, where do I get my warmth? Where do I get my coolness? Where do I get my water? Uh, do they happen naturally, or am I um, making it happen in some fashion? Um, this is a little rustic planter box with some rosemary planted in it. This is the trailing rosemary. Uh, and it, uh, as far as I can tell, gets zero water during the summer uh, and uh, does just fine. It, you can see it's old. There are these crangly old branches here that have obviously been there for a number of years. And growing right next to it is a, a live oak um, which is kind of dwarfed over here. Um, but that means that this is a very dry area. Um, live oaks do not grow where things are wet. Um, and although there may be water here now from all the storms, and th this is a hillside up here, um, during the summer, it will be bone dry and probably not get any water, but do just fine. Um, lavender is one of our favorites uh, here at the nursery, but I think in lots of gardens. Um, this is Spanish lavender, which is the first to bloom. Uh, again, uh, a sunny spot. Um, it's growing with um, some succulents. Uh, and everybody will be happy. Uh, the succulents don't need a ton of water. The lavender doesn't like a ton of water, um, and, but it does like full sun and it's getting it there and doing nicely. Um, boxwood is something that you can grow in almost any setting um, here in Marin. Um, it, it's amazingly cold tolerant, even though it's evergreen and we don't have any worries about it getting too cold. Um, it's also very drought and heat tolerant once it's well established. And you see it sometimes trimmed as a as a squared off hedge, or these are growing in a little more natural way. They're not very old. They may be, you know, been in here of uh, three years or something like that. Um, but they're growing just sort of naturally, and I, I like the look of them. Uh, they develop this um, kind of copper color or bronze color during the winter as a reaction to cool temperatures. It's very normal and they green up again uh, once the weather warms up in the spring. Uh, but they can grow in full sun. Uh, here they're in about half sun. 
uh, they can grow in full shade. They can grow in a small container and be very content. Um, there are um, types of boxwood that get bigger and types of boxwood that stay very small. So you can look for the one that's right for the kind of size and shape that you're ultimately looking for. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you can grow it almost anywhere except if you have poor drainage, if you have an area where water pools or sits for any length of time, the boxwood won't do well there. And in fact, most things won't do well there. Uh, and you'll have to come in and talk to us about some plants that will work in that kind of area. Um, there is a swamp milkweed, and there's also a, a bog um, um, sage um, that both do well in really soggy areas, uh, and we can help you find those if you need them. Um, I'm going to skip the Westringia. Now, uh, this is a funny, uh, you know, design in a way. You got the, the walkway that goes straight up to this big circle uh, and then stairs way over here. Um, and it's a little incongruous looking, but um, this is a very nice uh, pineapple guava growing here uh, that must be, oh, 10 years old or so. Uh, they have beautiful red and white flowers and then the edible guava fruits. Uh, and, and they are just uh, about a bulletproof um, plant for a sunny area. Um, in Marin, uh, and they get up about eight feet um, or so. Um, so they make a nice focus plant, uh, or they can be used as a hedging plant. Uh, and they've got other Mediterranean plants here. The, these are lavenders, and it looks like there's a, some rosemary here in the front, possibly. Uh, and then they've planted some bulbs underneath. Uh, and, and bulbs are from... Uh, most of them are from Turkey and the Middle East um, and quite compatible with most everything we do here, although some uh, some of the tulips and hyacinths uh, need chilling, uh, more chilling during the winter than uh, we have naturally for them here. Um, I mentioned Nandina when we looked at that first picture of the garden with all the Mediterranean plants in it. And this is kind of a mid-level shot of a Nandina growing in about half shade, uh, kind of filtered shade through big trees. Um, it's thriving. It uh, looks to me like it actually enjoys about half shade and some more moisture better than being out in the hot sun, although we generally uh, uh, recommend it for the full sun areas. But um, it, it clearly is very happy here and it's bloomed well and it's making all these pretty berries now uh, and the leaves look really good. It may not make as much uh, color in the leaves in the part shade like this. Um, one of the reasons one grows Nandina is for the kind of reddish, orangish tones of the leaves that are there year round, uh, not just in the fall. And so growing it in more shade uh, like this may cause it to be greener, um, but it might be a trade-off that's uh, worthwhile uh, since it looks really good. Um, this is a garden that, that has really big trees. You can see some of the trunks in the background. Uh, and that usually means that you're gonna have kind of dappled sun throughout the day. Uh, so you won't have the kind of full sun situation that we define as, as between four and six hours of uh, midday sun, basically, between 10 and four o'clock. Um, you'll have sprinklings of sun um, throughout the day. And uh, um, some of the plants that are more uh, woodland plants might be appropriate there. Uh, they're not necessarily Mediterranean plants. They're plants that need a little more moisture, but um, it, often people will use azaleas, rhododendrons, 
uh, things that like dappled sun and uh, a little more moisture. Uh, but you have to be able to provide the moisture because um, we won't get it from rainfall. Even if you have shade, uh, you won't have water unless you supply it to the plants. And you can make areas that have a moisture microclimate by irrigating, or you can have shady areas that are um, more uh, dry shade uh, and that can support plants that uh, can thrive in dry shade. Um, Sarcococca, uh, which is called sweet box, is, is one of them. Uh, um, Helleborus does quite well in dry shade. Um, Hookera, which is uh, alum root, um, uh, does very well in dry shade. And that's important to know here in Marin because many of us live in a, a kind of an oak woodland setting and we have live oaks. And it's pretty critical that you not uh, keep a wet environment under a live oak um, because of the oak root fungus, armorilia, that uh, will attack the roots. Uh, it, it doesn't do it during the winter when the rains come, but it will do it if you irrigate heavily uh, during the summer under uh, a live oak. Uh, if you have a deciduous oak, uh, it's not a worry. Uh, they don't have that problem. They, they like the water. Uh, and in fact, they only grow where there's water that they can get their roots down to. Um, but the live oaks go basically go dormant during the summer, even though they keep their leaves and uh, you want to keep the water away from them. So finding things that like dry shade uh, is, is important. Um, this this uh, is an example. I, I, I thought I would take the picture because it, I think it's an example of a plant that's placed in the wrong microclimate. Um, this is a camellia. And it's growing in the full sun, uh, again, in Fairfax, which gets pretty warm during the summer. Uh, now, it looks like it's surviving just fine. It's blooming well. Um, it's a number of years old. You can tell by the diameter of the trunk that it's been there a little while, maybe 10 years. Um, but um for it to thrive like this uh, they must be supplying it with uh some a good deal of summer water and even the a uh, little time when the water is cut off might uh be very damaging to it um so if it were me i would plant it in a spot that has more just the morning sun uh, and has a chance to cool off a bit in the mid to hot afternoon, uh, mid to later hot afternoon time. Uh, I, you know, I have seen camellias growing in full sun out in the Central Valley, and I don't understand how they survive, except that the Central Valley parts that I saw them in have relatively high groundwater. Uh, and so they must be getting constant groundwater. Uh, and so there might be areas, for instance, in Mill Valley, uh, the, the area around Sycamore Park has uh, a very high water table. And it might very well be that something like a camellia, once it was well established, would do very well because you would end up with a moist soil microclimate. Uh, in that setting. Uh, during the winter, people in Sycamore Park can put a shovel, you know, a shovel's depth down, they'll find water pooling. Um, so the water uh, uh, table is quite uh, high. Um, not sure why I took that, except that it was uh, in full bloom. Uh, it's a plum. Um, now, he here's a garden that um, my wife and I kind of uh, say is overplanted, but this part isn't. Um, these stairs are really pretty. Um, and uh, 
they've used rosemary here and um i'm not sure what what all they have some lavenders and i think some uh santa barbara daisies growing um and uh you know it looks really nice and over on the side of this is the same garden going down the street um they've got rosemary and mexican sage and then um, these taller um uh, this is not madrone although it looks like it it's uh, arbutus marina which is a hybrid between our native madrone and the european strawberry tree um and uh you know this is a nice combination and the the rosemary the prostrate rosemary could conceivably drape over the wall um and it looks really nice i think um and you can see it it's quite long uh and uh, they did a nice job with it um here's uh, what i call a borrowed microclimate um you might have heard of borrowed scenery where you know i look out at my neighbor's nice redwood tree or something like that um, this is a borrowed microclimate um, to grow this orange which looks very healthy i i haven't tasted them so i don't know whether they really ripen up sweet or not but it's clearly very happy here and it's growing in this yard the one toward us um, the fence line is the separation between the properties going up this way and the the wall big tall wall two-story wall of this house is uh, only a few feet away from the tree so again um, the tree is borrowing the heat and the reflection off of the wall uh, to make it feel as though it's a little warmer climate than it really is it also has all of this concrete around it which you might think wouldn't be a happy situation but it probably is because it again it absorbs heat and it radiates it out at night. Oranges are right on the edge of what you can grow in the way of citrus uh, here in Marin. And they only do well in the warmest uh, spots. Um, most oranges that people grow will make fruit, but they don't sweeten up very nicely. Um, but this one might very well. Um, you will do better with lemons and limes in general and mandarin oranges, um, which uh, are small enough that they can sweeten up just fine. But a big navel orange is very difficult and a Valencia orange is almost impossible to uh, ripen around here. Uh, and certainly you don't want to be growing grapefruit, um, which again will give you lots of grapefruit, but they will be, um, well even more unpalatable than they usually are let's put it that way um now this is a this is a funny um microclimate analysis here i thought th this was just like perfect um this is a set of duplexes two here two here with the driveway up the middle uh the duplex on the left faces due south and the sun shines here all day and the duplex on the right faces due north and the sun never shines over here and the people over here on the left a little hard to tell but this is a very pretty little uh, lemon tree full of lemons uh, doing very well over here and over here they've tried it looks like various things a little hard to make out they've they've uh uh, they've got some um what are these jen um can't think of it um i think it's diades i think it's diades too yeah uh fortnight lily uh which will grow almost anywhere and i can't remember what this was but it, this is a difficult place to garden if you are looking across at your neighbor and going oh let's put in a lemon tree or oh let's put in something that'll be nice and bright and sunny well it's not it's not sunny at all and um they would be um better off over here uh putting in some real 
shade lovers. Uh, and that might be something, uh, uh, they can be something kind of tropical looking, um, like fatsia, um, or um, a bear's breech, or um, gosh, uh, clivia, which uh, has strappy leaves and a big orange flower that does very well in heavy shade. Um, and so there are things that could be done here, um, but it's real dark and uh, is, it isn't going to ever get any direct sun, basically. And then if you go back up the driveway, uh, here's another wonderful deciduous magnolia blooming away. And again, like the one we looked at earlier, it's in kind of a perfect setting. It's got lots of sunlight uh, on the top for the leaves and to make flower buds. And then it's got shade from the building and from this fence uh, that keeps the roots cool and would be relatively easy to irrigate and, and keep moist during the hot part of the summer, uh, which it'll really appreciate. So, uh, you know, this is the way I look at um, exposures and climate, if you will, microclimate. Um, this is going to be hot and sunny. Um, this is going to require irrigation during the hot part of the year. Um, this is going to be cold relatively and shady. It'll require much less irrigation uh, because it won't have the sun baking it and it won't have the heat of reflected off of the building. Uh, and uh, then I can choose plants that I will hope will enjoy those different areas and give me some satisfaction growing them uh, as well. Um, oh, there's the cat. Um, I, I thought I would just take this picture. Um, this was at the same, same duplex complex, but out on the corner by the street. Um, this is an asparagus myri, which are um, sometimes called foxtail fern. They're not a fern, they're, they're a flowering plant and an asparagus. Um, but um, you can see that it is happy as a clam and you don't often see them as wild and, and kind of Dr. Susie as this one is, um, but the color is wonderful. Uh, it can take anything between full sun and very little water to full shade and quite a bit of water. Um, very adaptable plant. And in this case, it's in uh, mostly sun. Uh, now, uh, this uh, is a manzanita. Um, this is Arctostaphylus Howard McMinn, uh, which is a wonderful native uh, shrub that can take your full sun to half sun situations and once well established, which means three or four years, uh, can probably get through the entire summer without uh, water, uh, supplemental water. Um, and uh, they get up about six to eight feet and about the same width and make these lovely uh, little pink flowers uh, during the winter uh, and the hummingbirds will feed on them and the bees that come out early in the spring, uh, native bees will feed on them as well. Um, uh, to the right of this is a little olive tree uh, and olives are, whoops, I lost it there, didn't I? Um, there it is. Uh, olives are very adaptable. Uh, and and really make a, a great landscape plant for lots of different areas. They come from the Mediterranean. They, you can think of them as growing on the rocky islands of, you know, off of Italy and Greece. Um, but that's not the only place they grow. And uh, they can grow in your garden where there's moisture or they can grow where there's no moisture. Um, this one um, doesn't really get any irrigation at all, uh, and it's kept trimmed. Um, it's about uh, 10 years old uh, from the original planting, uh, 
and it usually gets trimmed to about above the fence line there a couple times a year so that it stays small. And they're very easy to keep small if you have a spot where you'd like um, a, a small tree. Uh, they'll get big if you let them get big, um, but they don't have to. And they're really delightful uh, in almost any setting. Um, this is star jasmine. Uh, it um, isn't a true jasmine. It's a, what we call a fake jasmine, um, but it's called jasmine because it smells like jasmine. It's very sweet. Blooms, blooms during the summer, and it often turns reddish like this during the winter as a reaction to cold, but then greens up again. Um, this one is in a shady location. And as a result, it probably doesn't bloom as much as if it were in a sunnier location, but it's in a pot. Uh, it'll live its entire life in a pot and it'll live a long time. Uh, and uh, it'll grow six or eight feet without any problem, uh, even in the pot. And uh, uh, it could grow out in the sun, but then it would have to be watered much more often during the summer. So growing in a pot like this during the summer around here, it would have to be watered about twice a week uh, during the hot part of the year. And if it were out in the hot sun, probably every other day uh, to keep it happy. Um, that's not a good picture. It's a, it's a European uh, strawberry tree in a pot, but it's not a good picture. So I'm gonna pass it up. Um, succulents, uh, are uh, another set of plants that are extremely adaptable. Um, this is a bowl of succulents that's growing in complete shade. Um, it gets no direct sun whatsoever, um, but it's very open shade. And uh, I wouldn't call it a dark location. Um, and you can see that the succulents are all real happy uh, and they're not all um, stretched out looking for more light. Um, they're happy with what they have uh, and they do bloom from time to time and they could grow out in more sun, but then they would need more water. Uh, so again, this, the, this is a continuum, if you will. Uh, the plants in more shade will need watering less often. The plants in more sun will be need watering more often. And that's something that uh, you can sort of plan for. Uh, out in the full sun, these would probably need watering a good soak once a week during the summer. Um, where they are, they don't need it more than about every two weeks. Um, so they're much easier to maintain. Um, let's see, I think, um, I want to go back to um, <laughs> those little pictures of uh, the flowers that I passed by very quickly and just talk about some plants that you can think of as bedding plants for particular microclimates. What are these? These are violas. Uh, violas are the small version of a pansy. Uh, pansies are basically hybrid violas that have been grown for a bigger flower. Uh, but violas uh, are very happy during the winter out in the full sun, uh, but during the summer, they're not. Uh, and although they'll keep growing and they'll even bloom during the summer, they really have to be in the shade during the summer. Uh, and so if you know that, then you can plan for that and you can say, well, I really like violas, but uh, it makes more sense for me to grow them during the winter because the spot I have for them is out in the full sun. Uh, the calendula, this guy, this is a calendula with the light shining through the back of it. Um, so it's a little ethereal looking. Um, but calendulas are a wonderful uh, winter flower that need to grow out in the full sun in the winter, and they really don't grow during the summer. Um, they will self-seed uh, themselves. Um, 
this is a seed pod here. You can see the dried petals from the flowers, and this is another seed pod developing here. If you let them form and let the seeds fall, uh, they'll often uh, take root and uh, grow up a new plant right there where the old one was. And eventually, after the old one is looking even more scraggly than this one, uh, you can pull it out and let the little ones grow. Um, so they're a wonderful uh, winter sunny plant. Uh, if I don't have a lot of pictures here for you, but if you want a winter uh, shady flower, uh, then you're thinking about the various kinds of primroses uh, and you're thinking uh, about cyclamen um, and those can give you lots of color during the winter. Um, they do well in full shade or during the colder months, even right out in full sun, uh, if we have any full sun, depending on the year. And then as the as spring comes along, then we start thinking uh, about sweet peas, um, poppies start to appear. Um, not the not the California poppies uh, so much as the uh, big round uh, poppies that look like uh, opium poppies uh, and that sort of thing, which are gorgeous, and Iceland poppies, which have all kinds of pastel colors and are gorgeous. Um, uh, if I had hours and hours to talk, uh, I would talk about where various plants come from, but I think we listed a few of those in uh, the outline. And it's just kind of curious to know that, you know, some of our more common plants come from Chile or from South America uh, or uh, from Australia uh, because of the similar climate. And uh, um, if you get yourself a Western Garden book, oh, I, you know, I, I meant to talk more about the Western Garden book right at the outset, but let me pitch it right here and now. Um, the Sunset Western Garden book is the one best gardening book in the world. Um, even though it's out of print, um, it's the it's the book that you want if you live in California uh, to be your reference work. And it doesn't matter which edition you have. Um, the most recent edition was in uh, 2011, I believe. And it looks like this. And you can find it at any of the booksellers online. And some of them want a lot of money and some of them don't want quite so much. But you can get an older edition. This is a 1995 edition. It's virtually identical. Uh, and you can get this for five bucks um, at any of the booksellers online. So get one uh, and look at it and realize that it has, just has a host of information for you. Which this did is, do you have, Jen? Well, I I have four different versions, but I look at it so much that it's falling apart. I need to put tape on it. <laughs> so this is the one I. This is that whatever version that is. Um, yeah, that's a, that's another. I think that's the one before the most recent one, but um, it it really doesn't matter which one you get. So get one. Um, look over the zones. Look over the descriptions, and then every plant description in the book will give you a zone rating. Uh, of course, our our winters are so mild here that we can grow almost anything in terms of the cold. Um, there are exceptions. You're not going to bring something over that grows in Hawaii, probably, and grow it here. Um, but, uh, you know, and real tropical plants that we grow as house plants won't grow outside here in the winter. So don't don't take me literally when I say we can grow anything, but we can grow almost anything uh, and probably more things than almost anybody else in the world can grow right here in our neighborhoods. So uh, I hope that's giving you some little bits of information. Um, um, I will be happy if there are any questions to uh, address, are there? Yeah, there, there is, but <clears throat> what I was gonna say is what Dan and I were talking about earlier is that, and this came up in our class last week, is really 
anything that we sell at the nursery, you can grow in your garden, but it's a matter of figuring out your microclimate and what's the most effective place to put it. So you could grow a camellia in full sun, like that one was growing, but then you're going to be watering it more and blah, blah, blah. And so finding the, 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 the best combination for the plants and the environment, it just makes, it makes it less water overall, more efficient. The plants tend to do better um, and whatnot. So, yeah, I think, I think your illustrations really, really showed that nicely. So that was really good. The pictures. There's a question from somebody in Woodacre um, mm -hmm. on, on our close to our side of the tracks. Yeah. Um, I'm in Woodacre on shady side, only five or six hours of sun, have lots of brassicas growing, but heads are not growing. No heads on kohlrabi. What to do? <laughs> well, okay. This is a vegetable gardening question. We're going to talk about that when two weeks from into like 10 weeks from saturday so tune in a week from saturday 10 o'clock um you may not have enough sun for them to head up um that just may be a fact and the good news is that you can eat all parts of brassicas so you can grow them for their leaves and use them you know use the leaves you could try some different varieties um some of the um different broccolinis um and see if those will give you some sprouts um there are uh types of sprouting broccoli uh that don't make big heads but make small heads uh and that might work for you so uh i would say experiment with varieties and um if if nothing will give you flowers which is what the heads are then you are really a green a greens grower um so stick with the lettuces and spinaches and um bok choy and you know the uh, arugula and there's just tons of things good things to eat um but it may not be the right microclimate for growing the heading uh brassicas <laughs> 